Good morning. Hope everyone had a great Christmas. For those that attended the candlelight service, I just want to say thanks. Uh, I enjoy that every year. Uh, as far as announcements go, the Deacon of the Week uh, will be Jim Hudson. If you need anything, you can contact him. His phone number is listed, along with obviously Pastor Dan. Um, don't forget that we still have the Christmas cards back here in the best field. Uh, check on that before you leave. Uh, we still have uh, one December birthday, which is today for Jack Lightcap, and then the January birthdays are listed. Are there any other announcements? Uh, Brother Danny? You would. Uh, the church wanted to give you and something. This is a Christmas gift to say thank you. Oh, thank you uh, very much. Especially after the year we've had, we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Uh, as far as prayer requests, are there any prayer requests that need to be added? Uh, and for those of you that don't know, uh, the surprise. I've uh, been hit with COVID, um, pretty much the whole family. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, I talked to Donnie yesterday. He just says they're they're tired and achy and hurting. Uh, but other than that, I think that's pretty much the worst of the symptoms. So uh, if you get a chance, call or text. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Uh, I've already told them, you know, if they need something from town to just call me. I'll be more happy to leave on the porch. There's uh, this uh, lady that uh, Carolyn Yates, I don't know if any of y'all remember her or know her, but she passed away. She used to live right over here in the uh, subdivision. And some of the kids at her Ernie's age went to school with her daughter and knew her real well. And uh, Sherry Yates. Sherry Yates. And uh, Betty's cousin and Peggy's cousin and Richie's. Joanne Collins' daughter passed away uh, Christmas Eve, Christmas morning. 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 Mike and Suzanne Woodis. Suzanne ended up getting to go home. They did surgery on the hand. Her pelvis was broken, but they were think that the muscles and everything hold it in place, and she's going to be at home and be doing therapy there. So. Uh, I appreciate all the prayers for, for my folks. Uh, my mom uh, is still in the hospital. They haven't released her yet. They're, they're saying that her breathing is not where they want it to be before they would let her go home. I think she's doing better, but she's just trying to get over that. She said she thinks it could be pneumonia. Um, and then my dad, uh, who's had COVID this week as well, uh, is doing a lot better. Um, he, he was doing well enough to call and rub, in, rub it in my face that uh, UK lost this week. So <laughs> I, I think he's doing okay. But, uh, but anyway, thank you for your prayers for them. And please just continue to pray for them so that they'll get back on their feet soon. As far as announcements, those that participated and helped set up the uh, drive-by live nativity, thank you. I Amen. think that was a huge success, and I know I enjoyed it. So yeah. um, we had a lot of traffic come through, mm -hmm. a lot of people. So yeah. thank you for those involved. Yes, ma'am. Uh, David's granddaughter's husband passed away on Christmas Day. Okay. Any other prayers? I would. Yeah, my uh, Lynn's uh, aunt, her mom's sister in Tupelo passed away this last week, and, and the whole family has COVID too, so remember that prayer. All right, we'll go with me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day that you've blessed us with this morning, Lord. And I just thank you for this season of celebrating your son's birth, Lord, and the time we've had with families, Lord. I just thank you for those opportunities. I just ask now that you be with prayer requests. It's too many to mention, uh, but specifically be with uh, Brother Danny's parents as they fight the COVID virus and the surprise. Just lay a hand on everyone uh, that's listed and all everyone that's on everyone's hearts. We just ask all these things in your name. Amen.
sing it softly? couple of things to um, to do. I do have some other envelopes for some people. Um, Leanne Pearson, um, just a way of saying thank you for everything that you do for us throughout the week. Uh, for those of you who do not know, uh, your bulletin in your hand this morning is a product of uh, Leanne, so make sure you thank her for that. Uh, Missy, I'm going to make you walk a little bit. <laughs> I think we all are thankful for Missy's people playing every single week in her time, uh, sharing that with us. And then, uh, Bill, this is for you. Thank you for all of your service each week, making sure that we have songs to sing and lead us in worship. Thank you guys very much uh, for being a part of our Sunday morning. And, uh, and then Angie and I uh, wanted to share uh, a Christmas card uh, with each and every one of you. I don't, I'm not sure if it's kosher to read your own Christmas card to other people. I don't know. Uh, when did we become kosher? I don't know. Uh, but anyway, uh, the light of the world has been born to us this day. May we rejoice in his blessing. Um, and this is what I wrote to you all. Uh, brothers and sisters, in the midst of what could be the most unforeseen year imaginable, uh, Angie and I have felt so incredibly blessed, blessed to have spent a year getting to know you all, partnering in the Lord together, and walking beside all of you in community. And so it is with thankful hearts that we wish all of you, our church family, a very Merry Christmas. May the hope and joy of our Savior's birth guide you into the new year. Love Danny, Angie, Christian, Corey, Caleb, and Elijah. Merry Christmas to our Plano Baptist family. So thank you all very much for a wonderful year. Merry Christmas uh, to each and every uh, one of you. Thank you. Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 2. The book of the book, the book of Luke. <laughs> the book of Luke, uh, chapter 2. Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. What an amazing uh, blessing uh, to be here together this morning. To be here together this morning, I guess especially in the midst of everything that has happened uh, this past year, what a blessing uh, to be able to be here together. Uh, it truly is. But can you imagine for just a moment, can you possibly imagine what it was like in that week leading up to Jesus' birth? In that week leading up to Jesus' birth. With heaven full of anticipation, creation waiting on pins and needles. No one on earth except for Joseph and Mary aware that salvation was just around the corner. And then a baby is born. A baby. The angels sang of what Jesus' birth had brought to the world. What it had brought to you and to me, to us salvation had come. I hope you've been celebrating Christmas this year. I pray that you have been celebrating Christmas. 
A few weeks ago, we kicked off this December sermon series called Christmas at the Movies. And, and from what I can gather, most of you have really enjoyed it, which makes me so happy. For those of you who do not know what we've been doing, uh, we have been looking at a different holiday classic every single week. And we've been looking at this movie and we've been discussing how it points us to spiritual truths, to scripture, scriptural truths. On week one, we uh, talked about the Santa Claus with an E. Tim Allen uh, puts on this Santa suit and transforms into the big guy himself, the Santa Claus. And we talked about how that pointed us to Ephesians chapter 4, believe it or not, where Paul reminds us that as Christians, we are given a new identity to put on. We are given a new self. And the Holy Spirit comes into our lives and begins this work of sanctifying us, of transforming us into the image of Jesus. And so we're challenged to put on the suit that we have been given and to own it. On week number two, we talked about the movie Elf. We have a lot that we can learn from Buddy the Elf. But we learned a lot from Paul. I hope that every single time you watch the movie Elf, you'll be reminded of Romans chapter 10. I pray that every time you hear the code of the elves mentioned, that it reminds you instantly of what Paul had to say to the church in Rome. Treat every day like Christmas. Remembering that salvation has come. Jesus is the point all day, every day. There's room for everyone on the nice list. For all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone, even you and me. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. How will they know that Jesus has brought us salvation unless we proclaim it, unless we live it, unless we sing loud for all to hear? Which brings us to today's passage. One that I'm sure you're all familiar with. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. As we read this, I want you to pay close attention to the first few sentences that we are told from Luke. Uh, He wants us to know that everything he's about to tell us is grounded in two things. History and prophecy. He doesn't want you to doubt that this story you're about to hear is the truth. So here we go. Verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and to the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, Messiah, the Lord, has been born to you. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Or as the King James, peace, goodwill toward men. And when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been 
soul. Pray with me. Father God, we thank You for the celebration of Your Son's birth. We thank You for that blessed Eve. Father God, when You came on the scene and Your heavenly host declared to the shepherds, do not be afraid. For to You today is born a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Father God, it's the message that rings out every single day across this great creation. Do not be afraid. For unto you is born this day a Savior. And so Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would just place that incredible joy, that celebration in our hearts, Father God, that it might carry with us, that it might be the declaration that we proclaim, that we might join with the angels and daily declare a Savior has been born. Father God, we thank you for that blessed gift. We praise you for that gift. We praise you for your salvation. We pray these things in your name. Amen. It's a wonderful life. Respond as if you didn't know that was coming. <laughs> Oh man, it's a wonderful life. Came out in 1946, and it is considered by most people to be the quintessential Christmas movie. In fact, the American Film Institute lists it as one of the top 100 movies ever made, period, holiday or otherwise. It is a classic. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to name any other holiday movie that is not more recognized or more broadcasted than It's a Wonderful Life. I guess you could probably say it is the Muhammad Ali of Christmas movies. <laughs> For those of you that are younger, AKA the greatest. It's a Wonderful Life. Now in case uh, you are one of the, uh, I don't know, one in a billionth person who's never seen this movie, then here are the basics, right? You, seriously, Oh my goodness, we got one in the room, one in the building. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Here are the basics. So Jimmy Stewart plays George Bailey. And George Bailey is this guy whose life has never really gone according to plan. Uh, and this particular Christmas Eve, after everything falls apart yet again for him, he makes a wish. He wishes... He had never been born. And so God, God sends Clarence, his guardian angel, to show George just what life would look like if he were to get his wish. What life would have turned out to look like if he had never been born. And man, it is drastically different. Now, now, I mentioned that nothing ever seems to go right for George Bailey, and that's the absolute truth. I, I mean, in the film, everything just keeps falling apart on him. Ever since he was a kid, he had like big dreams, big plans. He wanted to leave his small little town, and he wanted to travel the world. He wanted to build skyscrapers. He wanted a suitcase this long, if you remember the movie. He wanted to go out and make a difference in the world and to see everything he could possibly see. And yet, at every single turn, he finds his plans hijacked. Almost as if God had other plans. It all comes to a head when George's father passes away. And the town Scrooge tries to buy out the Bailey family business so he can shut it down. The only way his father's investors won't sell is if George stays to take over his father's business. This was not how George foresaw things going at all. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census would be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. And so Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and to the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. 
And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. And she wrapped him in a cloth and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Did you read that? I mean, surely this wasn't part of the plan. I mean, think of all the things that you know about this story that you've been told since you were little and tell me that this sounds like this was all part of the plan. I mean, the, the people of Israel were expecting a Messiah for years, for decades, for centuries, and they were awaiting this Messianic Rambo who would come and would liberate them from oppression, who would crush their enemies, who would reestablish Israel as a force to be reckoned with. What they did not expect was a teen mother pregnant out of wedlock. A scandalous marriage that presumably had the entire city questioning who the real father was. And for all of this to take place in Nazareth? Really? Nazareth? Even the religious later, leaders would later comment about Jesus. Can anything good possibly come out of Nazareth? How in the world did this fit with the plan? The Messiah wouldn't be born into wealth and luxury. He would be born in a stable among animals, among the filth and the straw. And yet there he was, the promised King of Israel, Savior of the world, lying in a feeding trough. That was the plan. Which serves to teach us something. It serves to teach us that God's plan often looks much different than our own. And where we see impossibilities, God says, just you wait and see. George Bailey would soon find that life for his family and his small community would have been vastly different had he never been born. Had he moved away, it would have turned out completely different. What seemed like setbacks actually served God's greater purpose. And the same can be said for us. This life will not always play out the way that you envisioned it. In fact, it usually doesn't. Amen? But it doesn't mean that God is in any less control or that He has somehow forgotten you. The reality is, when plans change, you are most on His mind. Perhaps He's preparing you. Perhaps He's teaching you. Perhaps He's setting the stage for a plan that is much bigger than anything you could have imagined on your own. Or maybe, just maybe, God is reminding us that His ways are not our ways. And while we look to the horizon for signs and for wonders, and we await some regal Messiah to march in. A baby is born in a stable. Reminding us that in the kingdom of God, things are never as they seem. That in the kingdom of God, things are upside down. That in the kingdom of God, the last become first. And the poor are made rich and treasures are stored in jars of clay. We see this idea continued in Luke chapter 2. If you continue reading, we pick up in verse 8. It says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. 
He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that you will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. And when the angels have left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. There's this scene in It's a Wonderful Life where George Bailey is sitting in front of Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter is the Scrooge that, that I told you about earlier. And Mr. Potter offers George a job. <clears throat> A ridiculous job with a fat paycheck. Because Mr. Potter figures that if he can't beat George, then maybe he can buy him off. But George Bailey can't be bought. Mr. Potter was not used to not getting what he wanted. He thought of himself as representing the, the, the top of the food chain, the, the social elite, the upper class. And he had very little respect for anyone else, much less George Bailey. See, the real reason why Mr. Potter wanted the Bailey family business was because it pained him to see anyone who was doing just as well as he was. Potter truly believed they didn't deserve it. Potter would hate shepherds. <laughs> he, would, he would just, he would hate shepherds. In Jesus' day, you have to understand that shepherds were thought to be unintelligent, dirty, riffraff. I mean, they were considered unimportant with nothing to offer society. No one would have ever given them a moment's notice. But remember, in God's economy, the lowly are exalted. No one is overlooked. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, we are told that God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise and that he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You have to see this. The first ones invited to the birth. The first ones invited to the party. Were shepherds. Shepherds. Talking about making a statement. I mean, yet another way in which God seems to say, yeah, this isn't going to go down the way that you thought it was. And I love it. Brothers and sisters, hear me. If there's not room in your hearts for the riffraff of the world, then there is no room for you in this story. I know that sounds harsh. But the truth is, if you want to get a chance to see the manger, then you've got to get up close and personal with some shepherds. Let me say it another way so you, it's perfectly clear what I'm saying. If you want to see Jesus, you've got to rub shoulders with the riffraff. You have to. And this is good news. It is good news. Because to be honest, we're all shepherds. We are all shepherds. And yet God has invited each and every one of us to the birthday party. George Bailey turned down Potter's offer because he chose to be associated with the riffraff. Because those were his people. Because he realized he was one of them and that was a good place to be. I'm going to do something that I don't typically do. <laughs> you guys are like, that seems to happen quite a bit. <laughs> I'm going to issue a spoiler alert. Now, I know just like a couple of weeks ago, uh, I specifically said I don't do spoilers. But I figure if you haven't seen It's a Wonderful Life by now, you are not planning to. All right? So we're just going to, here's a little, just a little spoiler, just a little one. 
All right? In the movie, George has had enough of Clarence's show. And he realizes that his life has had meaning. He realizes that God's plan for him was much bigger than his own. And he figures out that he has cherished the people that God has put into his life. And George wants to live again. And so he cries out for Clarence to grant him his wish. And as it results in the most iconic part of the movie, if, if you're not smiling at that part of the movie, then there's something dead inside of you. <laughs> oh, man. George running down the streets yelling like a madman. Merry Christmas, everybody! It's just wonderful, wonderful. Because he's got this incredible blessing of joy, this joy that's just leaping out of him that he, that he can't control. It's like he's been given this message to declare this new lease on life. A message of joy and of praise. Verse 17. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And all who heard it were amazed. The shepherds found that they had been given incredible joy. They had been given a message to proclaim, a message of joy and of praise. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace and goodwill toward men. You. Me, we have a message to spread to the nations and may all who hear it be amazed. May all who hear it be amazed. Pray with me. <coughs> Father, we pray that we might be challenged to carry the gospel message through the streets, waving our arms and declaring loudly like mad men and women. <laughs> Christ has come. That salvation is possible. That forgiveness is here. Father God, use us. Use your church. And I pray, Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know you this morning, they would call out to you to save them of their sin. That they would turn their life over to you. I pray, Father God, that you would instill in them that same joy and praise that we found here in these shepherds that many of us have discovered in ourselves. We pray, Father God, that you would use this passage to challenge us that it wouldn't just be a reminder of a birth that comes around once in a year, but that it might be a mantra that is played out over and over again in our daily lives. That Christ has been born. We pray these things in your name. Amen. I want to tell you all a little bit about this song. Um, it was one of the first songs I ever wrote, so I didn't really know I could write a song. And we were supposed to sing at church, and Usually I just pray about it and the Lord gives me a song. I know what I'm supposed to be singing. And this time it was not coming. It was not coming. It was in December. Um, so I was thinking Christmas song. Um, so I thought, okay, it's like 8 o'clock at night. We're supposed to sing the next morning. What am I going to do, Lord? And I just started reading Luke chapter 1 and Luke chapter 2. And within 10 or 15 minutes... It was amazing and it had never happened to me before. And it was like the Lord just put words and melody 
in my head, in my heart. I ran downstairs, I said, Anthony, he said, what are we singing tomorrow? And I said, I think we're supposed to sing this. <clears throat> From the cradle to the cross, a Savior born to save the lost. He knew the end, but still he walked. From the cradle to the Praise Him.